We extend our welcome to all, to each and every worshiper, a special welcome to you if you're visiting with us this morning. We're especially glad and excited that you're here, and uh, wherever you're seated, you are surrounded by ready-to-help uh, church members, so please call upon us if we can be helpful. We ask that everyone, members and visitors alike, please sign the friendship pads that uh, will make their way down each pew. And um, a word about our service today, and that is uh, our order of worship is a very close approximation of the original bulletin of the first uh, service, the dedication service here in 1912, with a few 21st century uh, adaptations that we cannot live without. Also, you'll see the layout is meant to be as close to the original in our bulletin, or as yes, as close to the original as our bulletin allows. And the service from which it was taken, you will find in the uh, anniversary booklet, the dedication booklet that you also have received. Next week, we will return to the regular schedule of two services, 8.30 in the chapel and uh, 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. A couple of announcements to remind you of. One is that following this service, there is a potluck luncheon that gives thanks for the recent uh, stewardship campaign and its completion. And uh, you all are invited to be part of that. Even if you did not uh, bring a dish or forgot that was today, still come join the congregation in the East Dining Room. And also, there is a new member exploration luncheon scheduled for next Sunday, November 11th, after worship. If you have interests or questions about that, uh, please see uh, Amy or myself after worship or call the church office. The Red Rose today on the baptismal font celebrates the birth of Tegan Perry Norris, the daughter of uh, John and Hillary Sandlin Norris, and congratulations also to Tegan's grandmother, Carol. And Tegan is here today. She uh, could not wait to come to church, and so she has perfect lifetime attendance at this point. <laughs> Additionally, too hot for the presses, born yesterday was uh, Lydia Irene Iwig to Scott and Heidi Mason Iwig. And the glowing grandparents are Don and Gretchen Mason. This morning, um, along with the many activities you see listed in the bulletin and the excitement of our service, we do have a special recognition moment from Gary Huffman. Just think 100 years from now, Tegan will be able to say she was here. <laughs> <laughs> and you will too. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to acknowledge the presence today of Marjorie Wooden Arnold. She joined this church on April 20th, 1930. Currently, she's been a member of First Presbyterian Church longer than anyone else. Marjorie, would you please stand so we can acknowledge your presence today? The sanctuary was only 18 years old when she joined this church. I think they both aged very well, don't you? <laughs> I also received this week some, a, a greeting that I want to share, uh, at least a portion of it, with you. Uh, when Bob Hoover was our interim pastor, one of the last things he told me was, I'm going to be there for the 100th anniversary of this sanctuary. Well, I'll read this note to you and you'll see why he isn't here, but he has a very, very good reason. Leaving Wichita December 1, 2005, after being at First Presbyterian Church as interim pastor 2004 and 5, I figured being back in Wichita would be no later than the first Sunday in November 2012 for the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the construction of the Grand Sanctuary Building. First Presbyterian's 1912 church building is a treasure in the heart of Wichita. Since leaving Wichita in late 2005, is anyone surprised that my heart still cherishes thoughts of the Grand Sanctuary, and especially so on the occasion of its 100th anniversary? For years, I figured I'd be there by first going to visit my sister in Lubbock, Texas, before going to Wichita. A year ago, she was diagnosed with colon cancer and died on October 14, 2012. Her memorial service will be in her hometown, York, Pennsylvania, on Saturday, November 3rd. That was yesterday. I'll be participating in the service. And of course, that precluded his being here today. 
And then he finishes, I wish the best for the 100th anniversary occasion in Wichita at First Presbyterian, a cherished home away from home for me. Sincerely, the Reverend Dr. Robert Hoover. may be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, our guide and gui guardian, you have led us apart from the busy world into the quiet of this sanctuary. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth, to the comfort of our own souls, and most importantly, the upbuilding of every good purpose and holy desire. Enable us to do more perfectly the work to which you have called us. Give us diligence to seek you, 
wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O oh God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us join in a responsive reading from Psalm 122. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. To give thanks unto the name of the Lord. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Peace be within thy walls. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus himself. He said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us pray for our offering this morning. Praise be to you, O Lord, from everlasting to everlasting. Here's, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Here's, O Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise. Your, and we praise your glorious name. Amen. Draw near, all ye people, come to Hear me, Lord, and 
answer me. Oh, hear me, O Lord, and answer me. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, oh, hear me, oh, hear me, and answer me, and show That thou art Lord God, and let their hearts again be turned. Oh, show this people that thou art Lord God, and let their hearts again be turned. Let their hearts again be turned. I'm just so used to our old liturgy. This is throwing me off. But if you would like to stand and greet one another as the time with the ch as, as the children come forward for the time with the young church. Good morning. They're talking about there today, but we're going to go ahead and, and talk. Look around with me. How is this room different than rooms you have in your house or school? What's different in this room than what you see in other rooms? Oh, yes. It's a lot bigger. It's a lot bigger, and not just this way, but, but also that way, right? It's, it's a lot bigger. Good. Good. How is it different, Samuel? Because there's candles. There's candles. Okay, so there's there's things on fire in here that, that aren't always at home. Yes, have a go. Um, there is a like a organ and a glass. Like a glass oh, so you don't have an organ at your home, Abby? No. Okay, and you don't have pretty I don't, glass. I do have candles. Oh, you do have some candles in your house. What what else do you notice, Emily? That's different. Um, Candles. There's candles. Anything else that's different here than in other places? Yes. Uh, the Bible. Okay, there's a Bible. Okay. Other places don't have that on display, Griffin. At my house, I don't have an exit sign. You don't have an exit sign in your house? Good, good. <laughs> Neither do I. On them. It makes two of us. What else is, is different? There's a lot of rows of chairs. Okay, good. So your house doesn't have stadium seating? 
No, no. So, so this just this room is different than other rooms, should we say? And and this room is called what's called a sanctuary. And a sanctuary is a place that's kind of set apart, so they might say holy, or set apart because it's special. So we do something special in this room that we don't do in other rooms. And what do we do in this room that we don't do in other rooms? Good, we worship God, we sing, and we pray, we, we read our Bibles, and sometimes we do that stuff at home and, and other places. But this room is specially set apart. Yes. Oh, and, and we give an offering here, yes, that we don't always do at home. You're right. You're right. So this is, this is a, special, a special space that's set apart. The word sanctuary that we use to use, we call this room a sanctuary, also means a place of refuge or asylum, which means it's a place that, um, that's kind of safe. It's safe from the world out there. So we come here once a week to come and to worship God and to just be together. It's kind of a safe place from the world. Do you know what's going on today? We're celebrating something about this sanctuary. Oh, it's the 100th, 100th anniversary for it. Okay, so 100th anniversary. So kind of like if we were to give a birthday to this sanctuary, to this room, if we did a, a birthday for this room, it would be 100 years old. That's pretty old, isn't it? I'm, I, I, how old are you guys? Nine, nine four, ten, eight. eight. Okay, so if we added up all of our ages, and I'm 36. Even if we added all of our ages, I don't think we'd make it to 100. So this building's been here a long, long time. And so we're going to thank God for this building today and pray that it might be here for a lot longer to be a place that we can continue to worship God and to, it, for it to be a place of rest. So let's pray. God, we thank you that we can come and worship you here today, and we ask that uh, you would bless us as we worship you in this sanctuary. In Jesus' name, amen. We have three scripture lessons today on this anniversary Sunday, hearing first from the Old Testament, from 2 Chronicles. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would reside in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to reside in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have not chosen a city from any of the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, so that my name might be there. And I chose no one to rule over my people Israel. But I have chosen Jerusalem in order that my name may be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. My father David had it in mind to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, you did well to consider building a house for my name. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, sh who shall be born to you, shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have succeeded my father David, and sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and have built the house of the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. Our second reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 4. 
And here we find ourselves stepping right into the middle of a conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. The woman said to Jesus, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. <clears throat> Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. And our last lesson is one verse from the Gospel of Matthew, and this is from the words of Jesus. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Friends, the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, week after week we are in awe of coming to worship and being in your presence and in your sanctuary. And this day, added to that, is the experience of this anniversary. Bless us as we worship you this day, the worship that began in this place 100 years ago. In Jesus' name, amen. What a glorious place today, and what a glorious place any day that you walk into this sanctuary. But today is so very special and so rich in meaning as we celebrate and commemorate and honor this place, but not only this place, also all those for whom this has been a church and a spiritual home. And not only that, but also we honor the living Christ who has been present here ever since that uh, first worship service and its dedication, the dedication being in November of 1912. Yes, what a, a glorious and fascinating and even mystical place and day to imagine here 100 years ago. As Presbyterians and likely friends and visitors of Presbyterians filed through the doors of this building and were in awe of this amazing worship setting, don't you wonder what thoughts and feelings and hopes filled the people who first assembled here that year? For on that day of dedication 100 years ago, this place from then to now is only somewhat different different only in a few details. Uh, this is a different communion table before us. The uh, pew arrangement is different. There were not the theater seating that you're enjoying. There were pews with uh, aisles that were everywhere but center. There were aisles dividing the congregation. And, um, and this day itself is different today uh, culturally. Uh, in that day, not only did they have this service, but you'll see in the booklet there was a 3 o'clock service as well and a 7.30 service. Those are exactly NFL times for us today. <laughs> we will not have those services. But in its essence, this is the very same place that those who lived and breathed their faith and who prayed and who worshiped the living Christ right here 100 years ago, experienced. And it's the same place because absolutely the very same presence of Jesus Christ was experienced here in 
1912 as today. As I've been thinking about this service and this sermon over recent weeks, there's an alternative sermon title that came to me, maybe a subtitle, and that would be something like, in 1912, what were they thinking? And I mean that in every way. Realistically, I wonder what were people thinking as they came into this sanctuary? What was on their minds as they began worshiping here? About the church, about their own lives, about the world. For example, do you know what was happening two days from now, 100 years ago? An election, the 1912 election. It was November 5th because that was two days after the third, of course. And uh, do you know who the primary candidates were in that election? Well, let me ask, do you know who won in 1912? The Democrat Woodrow Wilson won with something like 435 electoral votes. There were no blue states, red states. It was of different coloration then. But he clearly won over second place Theodore Roosevelt in the Progressive Party, who had 88 electoral votes. And coming in last place was the incumbent president, the Republican, William Howard Taft. He garnered eight electoral votes in that election. That was part of what was on their minds, or that, that would be the outcome of what was on their minds. In a visionary way, I wonder what did they envision the future of the church to be in 1912, and themselves? What were they anticipating and looking forward to? And also, in maybe an unsure kind of way, what were they thinking? In what ways might they have been anxious and uncertain or doubtful or skeptical that went along with being hopeful and faithful Christians. Well, I don't know if we can afford this place or maintain it. Look how big it is. Or people will flock to this place. It's so magnificent. The church certainly will grow. Don't we have a great new sanctuary after having been years, two or three years without a sanctuary? for this vibrant congregation in this young and growing city. Boy, I hope we survive as a church. After all, we're only 42 years old, and we've been moving from sanctuary to sanctuary, and the city is not that much older. How is the congregation thinking about themselves in the present tense? After all, they had come through an interim period of sorts themselves, their former pastor had left while they were ready to undertake this project. What were the developmental tasks they went through about their own history and their identity as a church? And how did they look ahead to the future in 1912, near term and long term? Did congregations even worry about future thinking at that time? Or did they just go about their work dutifully and their mission faithfully? And the future was in God's hands. In 1912, the membership of this congregation was 871, which is larger than the congregation is today. But that was down from a figure that was in the 1100s in membership just a few years before. And yet among all of these considerations, it must have been an exciting time as a congregation. There was a boldness of faith and there was an optimism, a visionary sense to undertake and accomplish a project like this during pastoral transition. In fact, here is the description of 1912 and the arrival of the new pastor as written in the, uh, the uh, Bound Church History volume, uh, This Is Who We Are, that white uh, hardcover book. It says, when the Reverend Andrew Melrose Brody came to Wichita in March of 1912, he found a church which was in a disorganized state. It didn't mean Kansas. It meant a disorganized state. The membership had been without a church home for some time, and factions had grown up in it. Imagine that, factions in a church. And it was as a result of locating the new building north of downtown rather than east of the railroad tracks. 
Some members lost interest while services were conducted at the Lewis Academy, a building not especially adapted for worship. Two, the church was without a pastor for more than a year after Dr. Perry left, although the Reverend F. L. Benedict carried on, who Gary Huffman says was not an interim but was an associate pastor. So you can see where the real strength and continuity is during an interim in the associate. The chief work of Brody was to establish the church in the nearly completed new building as a smoothly running and growing organization. That was the challenge that he faced as he arrived during the year of this sanctuary's dedication. Statistics then go on to show that after a several year period of numerical stability, that was followed by a steady rise in church membership throughout the remainder of Reverend Brody's nine year pastorate, um, arriving at just under 1,200 members by 1921. Now I myself have not researched firsthand any of the primary source writings of the 1912 church or of Reverend Brody. So I can't tell you exactly how they were thinking or the language which uh, they used to express themselves, what their hopes or dreams or anxieties were. And actually that's a good extra credit assignment. If any of you would like to take that on, see Professor Gary in the archives. But what I am as sure of as I can be is from a faith perspective, there were certain universal wonderings and hope and faithfulness all present 100 years ago. Today's passages help us imagine those because the exact same passages that we read today were in the exact same Bible that was the Bible of that time and the gospel message of the time. That has not changed over these years. And those messages were a part of the life and faith of this congregation. For example, as with Solomon, ready to dedicate the temple of the Lord that uh, the Lord God had allowed him to build. It is not hard to imagine First Presbyterians and the awe and excitement and the spiritual focus that they had uh, when they gathered to dedicate this sanctuary, making it their spiritual home where they would encounter God throughout their lives. The presence of Christ was here as they gathered. And then as we heard Jesus and the Samaritan woman have their sincere and searching discussion about the where that worship should took, take place. Is it here or is it there? Is it on the mountain or is it in Jerusalem? And uh, whose ancestors or traditions should we follow? In that conversation, Jesus makes it so very clear that real worship is spiritual and it's true. True meaning authentic and real and, and difference making. That is where God's presence and that is where God's presence is and that is where worship is to take place. And then from the third lesson we heard a truly defining sentence as Jesus taught the disciples then who were around him and hearing and his disciples for all time, the 1912 ones as well as the 2012 ones, when he said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there, in that place, in their midst. The very presence of Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Christ, the teaching and healing Christ, the forgiving and redeeming, loving and embracing Christ is present, that same Christ whenever two or more gather in his name. Of course it was true as Jesus spoke that right there at that time. In fact it might have even been easier because he physically was present, easier for folks to realize. But it was also true in November of 1912 right here in this place when First Presbyterians gathered to dedicate this sanctuary and make it their home then and forever since just as, as it is true this day in November 2012, as we remember 100 years ago, 
And as we do that, it makes me wonder, among many things, it makes me wonder what uh, that congregation may have thought about us. There must have been someone in that gathering that thought, I wonder what it'll be like a hundred years from now. What did they think about us? And you know, as, uh, as Gary mentioned, um, if we look ahead and think to uh, 100 years from now, and that would be, what, 2112? That's what my math tells me. That uh, any 100-year-olds then, any centenarians, would be infants who are alive now. Imagine that. Imagine the 2112 congregation being no further away from us today than we are from the 1912 congregation who started gathering right here. What will the First Presbyterian Church of Wichita in 2112 be remembering about this congregation and about you and about your time of being in the procession of saints who are a part of this church? What will they chuckle about thinking of us or roll their eyes about or shake their heads at or what will they admire as they think back to 2012? And for what will they be so very grateful as they see maybe some of our names and picture who we were gathering at this uh, anniversary? For sure, they will know that Jesus Christ has been present here, here in this very place. Because he is present here today, and he will be with them when they gather 100 years from now. Just as he has been continually and as he will be continually going forward from us. Let us now rededicate this magnificent place of Christ's presence for worship in spirit and in truth. As you were able, please stand as we rededicate this building and ourselves. Dearly beloved, it is meet and right that houses erected for public worship of Almighty God should be specially set apart and dedicated to religious uses. For such a rededication we are now assembled. Therefore, with gratitude to God, who has signally blessed his servants in this holy enterprise, with joy in the godly undertaking has been so far completed, and with earnest prayer that God may continue to bless richly all who have part therein and all who shall hereafter worship in this place. We For the reading of the sacred scriptures. We this For the preaching of the word of God. We For the prayer and praise the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We that the poor and needy may find help and blessing. We that repentant sinners may find forgiveness. That straying and lost may find their way back to God through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We that the sad and sorrowful may find light and comfort. We and since the dedication of the temple is vain without the solemn consecration of the worshipers also, I now call upon you all to rededicate yourselves anew to the service of God. To him let your souls be rededicated, that you may be renewed after the image of Christ. To him let your bodies be rededicated, that they might be fit temples for the Holy Spirit. To him, let your labors and businesses be rededicated to the fruit thereof may tend to the service of men, the advancement of the master's kingdom. We our souls, our bodies, our our Amen. Seated as we continue in prayer together. O oh Lord, as we remember and reflect upon the past 100 years of faithful worship and teaching in this place that has inspired faith and service of your people, 
we do rededicate ourselves in prayer to the Christ who is so fully and powerfully present. We pray this day for all who are in need of your healing touch of grace, remembering especially Jim Taylor in his hospitalization. We pray prayers of, of celebration and thanksgiving for new birth in the church family, the births of, of Tegan and Lydia. Surround them with good health and with your presence and faith beginning. We pray in deepest gratitude for all the saints who from their labors rest, as we all have experienced All Saints Day this past week, remembering loved ones who have gone before us to their eternal glory, whether passing recently or long ago, and they who have inspired us with their love and their faith. We do pray for all who are in need of life's essentials this day, and we pray especially for all who have suffered great loss from Hurricane Sandy this week, praying for healing and rebuilding. We pray for our nation as it exercises the glorious freedom of voting this week. And along with that, we pray for our nation as it lives beyond the election for healing the many divides among us. We pray for peace in this all too violent world and submit ourselves to be used as your peacemakers. We pray, O oh Lord, dedicating the congregation's stewardship response this year, the pledges received and those still to come, those that represent commitments of resources and also time and talent and prayers and love for your church. We pray for the search process calling the new pastor who will serve in this place and for all the pastors who will follow. And gracious God, hear our prayers for those selected from the congregation for this week's prayer list, as we remember Howard and Roseanne Waller, Judy Connors, Steve and Trish Fox and family, C Steve and Kristen Ivey and Annabelle, and Fred and Elaine Rontholtz. Bless them each with a coming week filled to overflowing with faith and hope and love. And hear us now, O Lord, as we offer the personal prayers that are centermost in our minds and on our hearts this day. Bless us, O Lord, as the congregation of First Presbyterian Church today remembering and appreciating the vision and faith of those who first worshiped in this place, and all who have served you faithfully here ever since, and all of us as we continue to strive to love and serve you, reaching out and sharing a nurturing faith in word and deed, and passing faith in Christ on to those who will continue to gather here in Christ's presence for years and years to come. We offer these our prayers to you, our faithful God, and we also offer ourselves to be used by you in answer to your prayers. For it is in the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray, as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
Sisters and brothers, the great procession of saints that filled this sanctuary 100 years ago and the procession of saints that will continue to uh, worship here and live their faith here uh, into the coming decades and maybe centuries both meet and connect with us. We are the connection between the two. For Christ is present here and Christ is alive in our lives. And for that we give great thanks and praise. And the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Amen.